Well, good morning uh, to all of you. And uh, please find in your Bibles Ezekiel chapter 38. If you're still having trouble finding Ezekiel from last week, it's uh, Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations, and then, then you come to Ezekiel. And we're going to look at Ezekiel 38. While you're turning there, just a couple uh, things. First of all, last week I failed to mention, I had it in, I think it was in your notes, and some of you, I think, maybe have picked it up. I used, I have, and they're back on the guest desk as you leave, um, just some things helping you as parents with your children. Um, this first sheet, how to use precise questions to turn your heart toward your children from Malachi 4, 6. Just a lot of different questions here that you may uh, want to spend some time talking with your, with, with your children. We're, we're living in a day when parents, unfortunately, are disconnected from their kids. It's always been that way in some sense, but um, Friday morning, Santa Fe, the parents of that shooter, uh, which, by the way, fit the profile of, of uh, shooters, um, had no clue. Um, that's not to fault them, or it's just the fact that we need to be much more in communication with our children than, we, than often we are. And sometimes that's difficult in the best of chances. So th this just is a help to you. If you don't like it, you can throw it away. But if it is a help, we can always print more. Evaluating your child's virtue and wisdom, attentiveness, obedience, loyalty, gratefulness. It comes from the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts. And, um, and so just throw it out to you to help uh, if, if that is, uh, gives you some things to talk about with your children. I was just looking at some of the questions. Um, what do you like to do most as a family? Do you know what your children would say to that? Um, or, I love this one. Um, if you could change anything about me, uh, that would be for the dads. <laughs> what, would it, what would you change? <laughs> that, that's a fun one. That's a fun one. Um, when you get to the end of your life, what do you want to look back on and say that you accomplished for God? That's a question, a good question for all of us, isn't it? So, uh, anyways, if it's help, fine. Uh, if it's not, throw it away. Um, all right, Ezekiel uh, chapter... Oh, um, I'm trying to remember all the things that I need to talk about. We talked about the Connect card. Uh, make sure you fill those out, put them in the... Hands of the ushers at the end, they're going to be walking around like Jim Bauer is now. Uh, he's, Robin's up here. Yeah, okay, got a founder, founder seat. Um, so you put them in the hands of the ushers. Uh, this is Great Commission Sunday. I'm going to address this in the message a little bit, but uh, this is a time to think specially, especially about our Great Commission Fund, the Impact Fund. And uh, we uh, support... Uh, nearly a thousand missionaries out of the Great Commission Fund, and then there are some like Megan, who uh, in North Africa, who are who are responsible for their own uh, uh, incomes. And I know as a church, you're helping uh, uh, her out in that. And um, uh, so we have different kinds of missionaries and different kinds of programs. If you're an official worker with the Christian Missionary Alliance on the mission field, you are funded by the Great Commission Fund. That's it. That's how you're funded. And so as a church, we need to make sure that we give priority to those kinds of funds. And um, uh, so we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But if you're not contributing to the Great Commission Fund, please your in market impact fund or great commission fund and that's where it will go to those areas in your offering or on your envelopes or as you give online all right let's pray uh, together our father we come to you in the name of the lord jesus christ and we want to thank you for being in this place where two or three are gathered you're present and so we thank you for being here 
Thank you for the worship that's gone on before, uh, that reminder to us in that last song that we are living in the victory. And uh, so many times, Heavenly Father, we forget that. We often disbelieve that, that you have given to us victory, and yet it is our position. Your word says that the Lord Jesus has raised us up with him in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and every name that is named. You have placed us in the victory. And Lord, help us not to be in the shallows of depression and weariness. But Father, you've given to us as your people, not as a reason for arrogance by any means, for we are totally dependent upon you. But Father, that we would recognize our position in Christ far above in the heavenly places is where we live and uh, may it be actualized in our lives as well. Help us now to hear your word. May the spirit uh, be heard in our hearts in what is said this morning for we ask it in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's people said, amen. We're going to start out with Ezekiel 38. And I want to talk to you about two things this morning. So it's really easy for those of us who have memory issues. Um, uh, last week I found my memory book. I lost it, didn't know where it was, forgot where it was, but I got it back. So uh, two things, we can remember two things, can't we? Uh, and what I want to talk to you about this morning is the, is the uh, forgot what the first one was. Um, <laughs> now, it, it was the arrangement of the nations. We're going to look at God, the how sovereign God works in arranging the nations for his purposes. And then finally, the adoration of the nations. The arrangement of the nations and the adoration of the nations is, are the two issues we want to uh, talk about this morning. Now, as, Israel, as Ezekiel 38 opens, it opens with uh, God baiting the nations. And I want to introduce it with this story because um, I always think of this as I read this text and some of the language here. When uh, Kathy and I were first married, and when I always say that, she gets really nervous, but this is a good story, honey. Uh, uh, we, uh, she wanted a dog, and, um, and so uh, I remember her and her brother, I don't think I was with you at the time, you and your brother went down to the uh, ASPCA or whatever it was and got this uh, dog and they named him uh, Buster. Buster was the name of the dog. And um, then she went to school. So, so she got the dog and her mom and her brother had to take care of the thing. So down when we were down at school, we were married and, and I um, was working in construction and things got slow. Now I want you to understand slower than usual in Georgia. In Georgia, everything is slow. Um, except the driving, talk to my son, um, but everything else is slow. It was Saturday afternoon, we needed a, we had a tire problem on the car and, you know, I'm racing into town to try and get it before the stores close and it's two o'clock Saturday afternoon, see a guy in his chair leaning up against the wall of a gas station and I said, hey, can you, can you help me out with a flat tire? And he goes, I reckon I can't. Okay, do you know who can? I reckon most people are done now. It's 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon. I had to wait until Monday to get the problem solved. So anyway, slower than usual. And so uh, for the summer, that summer, it actually was uh, the summer of the centennial year, 1974. No, 76, 76, sorry. Um, we were married in 74. In 76, we were working. And, uh, and so I decided to work uh, up north with her uncle who was building some apartment buildings and, and uh, just uh, working that kind of thing. And uh, so we lived with her uh, mom that, that year, or that summer, and, uh, and had, a, had a great time and uh, really got to know her brother. And the way this happened usually every night, she'd go to bed early, uh, earlier than I, and I would stay up with her brother. I shouldn't tell you this. And we watch uh, Monty Python. <laughs> you know, remember that Monty Python? And uh, we'd do that. And uh, so by the time I got to bed, this dog, mangy month that he was, uh, would be under her bed, under our bed. And I'd open the door. And as soon as I'd open the door to the bedroom, 
I could hear this <laughs> dumb thing. Well, we found out how to handle that all summer. We found out how to handle that, and uh, we kept cheese stocked in the fridge. And I'd take a slice of cheese, and I'd drop one slice at the edge of the bed, and he'd come out to that one. Then I'd, the next one went at the door of the bedroom, and he'd come out to that one. The next one went into the living room, and, and he'd come out and get that one. The last one, I threw it all the way out into the kitchen. He'd race for it, and I raced back into the bedroom and shut the door. That was every night, wasn't it, honey? It was every night that happened, you know, because I could not get in bed with that dumb dog under the, under the, um, um, is in heaven now? Um, uh, but um, I, and I did not put him there. Um, anyway, we open Ezekiel 38 with God baiting the nations. It's interesting. In his sovereignty, he's, you know, he's baiting all of the nations to attack Israel. And uh, not with cheese, but with Israel itself. He's placed her back in the center of the nations. And for the most part, what we're reading in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is future to us. And, and I was thinking as I was praying before the service earlier today, this is one of the most exciting times in which to live, isn't it? I mean, it can be scary, but this is really an exciting time. We're reading material that is prophetic to us. And it's coming. It's happening. Even, even this week, where was the, the embassy of the United States moved? From Tel Aviv, where the exiles were at the Kibar River, down. Now it's moved to, uh, to Jerusalem. Big celebration all of that this week, this is happening before our very eyes. We are living in these times. And uh, so uh, what I want you to see is that God, not rulers, not kings, not prime ministers, not presidents, but God is arranging the nations to fulfill his program. And that's what we're going to end with uh, as we work through this. So, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 4. We're going to be looking at a number of passages in your Bible or up on the screen. Most of them are there. And uh, let's look at it. And I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws and I will bring you out. See, that's buster. I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield wielding swords. So here are these nations and they're coming against Israel. Look at verse 16, Ezekiel 38, verse 16. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land in the latter days. So this is in future to us. It's coming and we haven't seen this yet. In the latter days I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me. When through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. That is God's program. The vindication of his holiness um, before the eyes, not of Israel, but of the nations. All right, go to Ezekiel 9, uh, 39 and verse 1. Ezekiel 39, verse 1. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief priest of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and drive you forward and bring you up from the uttermost parts of the north and lead you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and will make your arrows drop out of your right hand, you shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all of your hordes and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. So the picture here is that God in his sovereignty is bringing nations in the purpose of entrapping them, bringing the nations against his own people, Israel, who've now been replaced in the land, and in doing this without any damage or little, they are destroyed in the process. And this is a future event. So, how is God arranging the nations? Number one, please remember, 
Israel is the time clock of world history. Israel is the time clock of world history. Keep your eyes on Israel. Not on, not on the United States. In fact, if you go through the book of Revelation, it's really hard to find any kind of impact or influence or mention of what could even be construed as the United States uh, in the latter days. Uh, while it may be there, apparently we do not have that much influence in the later days. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't know. But Israel, Israel is the time clock for world history. Why is that? Well, let's go back to Ezekiel 5, chapter 5 and verse 5. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her where? in the center of the nations. Now, uh, years ago, back, I think it was around 2003, maybe 2002, I preached a series on Ezekiel in, entitled uh, something about what is in the center, because that is one of the themes of Israel. We haven't been dwelling on it this time around in 91 weeks, but one of the themes that you could preach on in the book of Israel is what is in the center. Uh, we often refer to God in the center of his people, in the center of the temple, now moved away and he comes back again. Israel in the center of the earth. What's in the center of your life? And actually, we're going to talk about that next week. What's in the center of your life? What's, what's, what is in the middle? What, what is in the middle of you? Um, and Jerusalem has been set in the center of the nations. And I think it could be argued geographically it is in the center of the nations. But more importantly, in influence, it is in the center. What happens in Israel affect all of the nations around about. Look at Ezekiel 38, verse 12. To seize spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and the people who were gathered from the nations, and be Israel, who have acquired livestock and goods, and dwell in the, at the center of the earth. The focus here is that God is bringing back his people to a place of, of centering. In other words, all the nations now are looking at Israel, what is taking place there. That's why when we move embassies and all this stuff, anytime you hear something on the news about Israel, pick up your ears, pick up your ears, redemption's coming, it's drawing nigh. Ezekiel 39, and look at verse 26, speaking of Israel again. They shall forget their shame and all the treachery they have practiced against me when they dwell securely in their land with none to make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from their enemies' lands and through them have vindicated my holiness in the sight of many nations. Again, God's full plan here. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God because I sent them into exile among the nations and then assembled them into their own land. I will leave none of them remaining among the nations anymore. Isn't that an interesting statement? Has that happened yet? No, because we have many Israelis and many Jewish people all in all, in all nations of the earth. But this says that there is going to come a day when he will leave none of them remaining among the nations anymore. Something's going to happen that will drive the Jewish people from all of the nations and they'll gather again in, in Israel. Um, so, take, bear with me a moment for a brief history lesson on uh, just in a broad brush. But when Israel really has not gone back to the Holy Land, uh, some are there, but uh, we, don't, we don't want to be too, too premature. It, like their exile, is taking place in waves. Now, it began in 1917 at what was called the Balfour Agreement. After thousands of years of being exiled, in 1917, the British government made a resolution and and that resolution was really kind of a, a, a watered-down compromise because at the time, the British government was in, uh, 
in this plan of luring the Arab states against the Ottoman Empire and so so they wanted to keep some friendships going on in the Arab countries and so it really wasn't a, a definitive declaration but I'll read it to you it was from the foreign office on November 2nd 1917 uh, it was uh, the British Foreign Minister Arthur Balfour, from which the name comes, wrote to Dear, Loth, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet of His Majesty's government view in favor of in, with favor, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Something really interesting that might pass your thinking that I, I studied this week is that he didn't say homeland. He didn't say, this is where you belong. He said, to establish a national home. Could have been anywhere, but... He recognized it, as, but he wanted to be, play that compromise. He did not say homeland, but a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. These are the ones that are throwing rocks at the, uh, at the borderline this past, at the, on the West Bank this past week. Uh, the, this is what the whole peace thing is about, is these people that are claiming Israel as home, the Dome of the Rock, the Islamic peoples and all of this, and, and Jewish people all fighting over the same land that God gave to the Jewish people way, way back uh, four some thousand years ago. So, or the rights and political status enjoyed by the Jews in any other country. I would be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation, Arthur James Balfour. And it goes on that the League of Nations approved this and, and uh, satisfied uh, this, this desire. And the next month after this was signed, in December, it was uh, General Allenby walked through the Jaffa Gate into Jerusalem's old wall city and claimed Palestine for the British Empire. And so now it has begun. After thousands of years of being exiled, the process has now begun in our lifetime. Then uh, we could talk about a number of things, but then in 1948, May 14, 1948, um, you have the next uh, issue, and that is the state of Israel is proclaimed and upheld by the United Nations, and that is the date we often refer to as Jews going back home. But again, that was just a, some of them. The door was opened. We still have many Jews around the world, and someday they will all be gathered home. So God's going to place Israel in the center stage of the nations once again. This is his hand arranging the nations. Israel, is t God's time clock, began with Abraham. 2,000 years before the time of Christ, God said, get out of Haran and uh, get thee out and I'll show you a land of promise. And so Abraham left and through Moses and David and the prophets, the time clock and the hand of God was evident upon this whole thing until you get to Bethlehem in the first century. And Paul writes in Galatians that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law and now and now. Uh, the process begins again. And for 4,000 years, until 1917, 1948, our lifetime, for 4,000 years, Jerusalem has maintained its national identity. This is what gives social scientists and historians, it, it gives them uh, uh, brain deadness because they can't figure this out. All of the other nations destroyed, or nearly so, but Israel has kept, in spite of its exile and its persecution, and six million of them killed in the Holocaust, Israel has kept a national identity. Do you not see the hand of God in this? This is God 
arranging the nations like a chessboard. And it's not the presidents, it's not the elections. As important as those things are, it is God arranging the nations. So the next question we might ask is, who is this Meshach, or Meshach and Tubal and Gog and Magog? They sound like names coming out of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine and the Mole People, whatever they were called. This is like, it's weird names. Well, we don't know. And I'll give you the bottom line. I'm going to give you a couple ideas, but I'm giving you the bottom line is we really don't know. We know where they came from, by the way. And uh, 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 someone pointed that, that out to me in, in earlier in the service, and I'd forgotten to put it in the notes. Genesis 10, by the way, tells us they came from one of Noah's sons, Japheth, but it was all centered around the Tower of Babel, that, that place where the na the uh, the, the languages were confused, which is, in a moment, you'll see it's precisely, precisely the point. Oh, by the way, let me clarify this, because Becca came to me and she said, did I get the wrong title? I failed to mention this in the, in the earlier sermon. Will Baghdad rise again? No, I'm, you know, that was the right title. It's just that when we talk about ba Babylon and Baghdad are so closely related Babylon was just a few miles away from the city, the modern-day city of Baghdad in Iraq, but that is the place of Babylon. In fact, uh, Saddam Hussein had a goal of rebuilding the wonder of Babylon, which God said would never be rebuilt again in, in that time period. So uh, that was all in 91 weeks. So who is this nation? There's a nation in... Uh, Ezekiel 39 verse 4 being sacrificed uh, against Israel uh, we would call it in baseball a sacrifice play and uh, this nation is being sacrificed the identity of it is Gog apparently the the ruler of the nation and Magog and Meshach and Tubal are coming from where the north against Israel and so let me give you two scenarios and I'm not suggesting either one of them. It's something for you to talk about and think about. But we really don't know. I want to interject a new idea for you this morning that for you to think about. I'm not being dogmatic, but let's think about it. Well, first of all, most people in the 60s and the 70s, when everybody was teaching on prophecy, most people uh, believed that Meshach was a, was a Hebrew... Um, transliteration of the word Moscow. How many have ever heard that before? That Meshach was Moscow. That Moscow, the, I mean, you can take an arrow and you can draw it straight from Jerusalem, straight north, and you'll hit Moscow. So everybody was saying, Meshach, these, these nations that are coming against Israel in the latter days will be the communist nations led by Moscow and China and all of these keep people coming down. That could very well be. That could very well be. But let me throw out something else to rain on your parade with that. And that is uh, the second mystery identity of Gog and Magog. We read of them first in Genesis 10 and Ezekiel here. But let me take you to Revelation chapter 20. While you're looking, Revelation, the last book of the Bible, near the end, uh, Revelation chapter 20. Let me give you a paint with you, and I hate to do this. Ever seen the news, the world news in one minute? Like, really. Uh, but let me just paint with you a very broad brush, quickly, a potential scenario for the future. And we know, for the most part, that the church awaits the next great event, which is the rapture of the church, the catching away, the parousia. Of, of the saints, the rapture that when church, Jesus gathers the saints home. That's what we wait for next. Now, some people argue, well, is that going to be before seven years of tribulation, that seven-year period where all the nation flocks in an uncanny way around, around one world ruler called the Antichrist? I mean, we're being set up for it now with things like American Idol 
and all of these things. And, and somebody's going to come along with an uncanny answer to all of the perplexing, perplexing problems of school shootings and, and terrorism and everything. And he will be set up as a world ruler called the Antichrist. And it won't be hard for him to, to uh, take over because we're, the name of Christ is being besmudged all over the place and we accept it. Uh, but he will be a world ruler for seven years. He'll make peace with Israel for three and a half. And some people say Jesus will come before then or during the middle. Uh, we, we all have different ideas, and, the, and, and that's fine. Um, but then after seven years, there will be the Battle of Armageddon. And after seven years, there will be a decisive, decisive victory of Christ. And Jesus will come and settle everything down okay then for a thousand years and i believe these are literal not everybody believes this but i believe there for a thousand years jesus will rule and set up his kingdom of his benevolent reign uh in this world for a thousand years and uh, i have i have um uh threatened if I didn't get a message plan for Sunday to preach on the subject, will there be animals in heaven? And I always thought that was humorous, and I was at a pastor's conference just a couple months ago, and the speaker really loved dogs, and I uh, had one good dog and one bad dog, and the bad dog he put in uh, this puppy, uh, what is it called, puppy camp, puppy playground or something, while you're away, and you can get in on your phone and see how they're doing and everything, and he told us that day, he said, well, today he's been in the sin bin all day. So that's a new word for those of you who have dogs. They put them in the sin bin if uh, they're, they're bad. So, and, and he said, you know, people ask me, this is a knowledgeable, I don't know how many doctorates he has. And uh, he said, he said uh, people ask me this question, will there be animals in heaven? I've never thought about this that much. And... And he said, what a dumb question. Of course there will be animals in heaven. And there will be mountains and fields and it's a new earth. What do you think? It's going to be really that different? It's going to be a whole new earth, just like the earth we have, all without sin. And there'll be all kinds of animals and that's where we'll live for a thousand years. I still don't think there will be any cats there. But maybe, maybe, maybe Solo has a chance yet. So uh, uh, look at Revelation 27, 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four, at the four corners of the earth. Gog, and, well, there they are again. Gog and Magog. After, after how many thousand years, they're still around. Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. The number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which probably is Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. Finally, it all ends there and God sets up his forever benevolent reign with a new heaven and a new earth. But Gog and Magog show up here. All right, who are these people? Meshach and Tubal. We know where they came from, but who are they? And the answer is really we don't know. But let me throw this out. If Ezekiel was using cryptography, which is a writing that often prisoners use. We know prisoners in World War II and the World Wars would develop some coding system of writing. And at the time of Ezekiel, there was a, there was a cryptography known as Atbash. A-T-B-A-S-H is the English pronunciation. You can look it up. But it basically, remember, Ezekiel was a writing prophet, and so therefore he didn't want those writings into the hands of the Babylonians, lest damage would come. And so it is quite possible, if Ezekiel is using Atbash cryptography in the writing of Ezekiel 38, especially...
and Jeremiah, by the way, in Jeremiah 25, if that is what is taking place, and by the way, at Bash is where the Hebrews would take the first letter of their alphabet and switch it with the last letter of their alphabet, take the second letter of the alphabet, switch it with the next to the last letter of their alphabet, and they would come up with a word. If you, if Meshach is at Bash cryptography, the translation comes out to be Babylon or Baghdad in that area. Isn't it interesting? Just a thought, just a thought for you to think about. Um, historically, it fits. No oracle against Babylon from Ezekiel 25 to uh, verse 32. There is no oracle against Babylon. And then I want you, uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, look, at, look at the fact that Babylon is a major player in end time events, both, both in in literal fashion and in, in um, uh, simile as well. Uh, Revelation 14, verse 8, I think it's up on the screen. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So Babylon comes back. By the way, the first mention of Gog and Magog is right before the Tower of Babel, where the, where the languages were, were changed. That all comes back together because we go back to Babel. Revelation 16, 19, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. The great Babylon came in. This is all future to us. Some of you may witness all of this. To give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Revelation 18, 2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of, jack of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of very unclean and hateful bird. And on it goes and on it goes. Just a thought that... Baghdad might rise again in the future. I think it's interesting. But let me close with talking about the whole reason for all of this. And that is the adoration of the nations is Jesus. That's what God's after. You know, we often hear about getting on the right side of history. Uh, the news commentators, you think, you think you're going to be on the right side of history? If you want to be on the right side of history, get in God's agenda, will you? This is why we do missions. This is why we talk about impact ministries. Because that is what God's about. Let me show you. Look, please, at Ezekiel 38. 30 times, 30 times in the book of Ezekiel, God does things so that Israel and the nations will know that I am the Lord. In the last days, there will be no atheists. Didn't someone say there's no atheists in a foxhole? At the last days, there will be no atheists. They will still be cursing God like Stalin, whose last, last breath held up his face to heaven and cursed God, and he died. And we're told that hailstones of 100 pounds. Now, that's one thing. Can you imagine the storm systems available that must produce that kind of hailstone? And yet they would hide in caves and yet curse God for what he was doing. My friends, Jesus is coming. He's coming. Are you ready for his return? Ezekiel 38, 23, And I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. That is God's agenda. If you want to be convinced and resting in the peace that God is sovereignly working in your life, because what he does is the same thing he did with Israel. He surrounds you with all kinds of insurmountable problems that cannot be fixed by the doctors, cannot be fixed by humans, and can only be fixed by God, and he wants you to turn to him. Some of you are surrounded not just on one side, but on many sides, but all kinds of dilemmas. How is this going to work out? 
Only God can work it out through his sovereignty as you trust him because he surrounds you with impossible situations so that you might trust him. Amen? Amen. And I will show my greatness. That's what God's after in your life. He doesn't want your greatness. Our righteousness is his filthy rags. He wants to show his greatness. Then they will know that I am the Lord. 30 times in the book of Ezekiel. Then they will know that I am the Lord. That's what God wants. He wants the whole world to know that he is the Lord. That's why we send missionaries to, to all of these countries around the earth. That's why I encourage you to support the Great Commission Fund and the Impact Fund and the Megan Pascarellas and the, and the Sherry Sears. Why? I, I'm so... I get so discouraged sometimes at, at how believing people build their own agendas in their whole life around some petty agenda that may fail. And yet God has given to us agenda. Get on board, get on the right side of human history, and get on board with God's agenda, and that is to make his name known in all nations. Then they'll know. Look at it, Ezekiel 39.6. And I will send fire on Magog and all those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 39.7. In my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I'll not let my holy name be profaned anymore. Isn't that a relief? Everywhere we go, we hear the profaning of the name of Christ in movies and around us and our co-workers and there will come a day when his name will not be profaned anymore and the nations shall know that i am the lord the holy one of israel chapter 39 verse 21 and i'll set my glory among the nations and all the nations shall see my judgment that i've executed and my hand that i have laid on them that is god's plan and the reason we do missions is that's where God is working. You want peace in your life? You want, you want to make sure your life is going to make a difference at the end of time? Forget about your name and get on the agenda of making the name of the Lord great and glorifying Him. Not you, but Him. Let me close with this. I've referred to Him here and there, British hymn writer William Cowper. Cowper wrote so many of the hymns that we know. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Those who plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And others. Cowper was so beset by mental anguish, attempted suicide many times, lived for the most of his life in massive depression. And yet he would write this stuff under the inspiration of, the, of God, I believe. Wrote these words, and this is an encouragement to us. For he wrote, God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and he rides upon the storm. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and will break with blessing on your head. The adoration of the nations, get on board with it. It's making the name of Christ great, not just among us four no more, but to the ends of the earth. Amen? Father, make it so through us, we pray in Jesus' name.